Hi, everyone, and a warm welcome from me to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight for the third of eight events in the Fall 2020 Design Lecture Series. I'm Helen Maria Nugent. Uh, I am the Dean of Design at California College of the Arts and a faculty member in the MFA Design Program. Um, up on the screen right now is a little bit of information about the Design Division. Uh, we host six undergraduate programs and three graduate programs in fashion, furniture, graphic, industrial, interaction, design at the undergraduate level, and an MFA in design, a low residency MBA in design strategy, and a one-year intensive MDES in interaction design at the graduate level. We see the division as a sanctuary for radical curiosity, a place where wonder and imagination are amplified through rigor and craft. We equip makers, thinkers and doers with the wherewithal to envision alternative futures, which we need right now, and the creative capacity, most important, to deliver these generative solutions and to inspire change. In partnership with our colleagues in fine arts, architecture and the humanities, our collective purpose is to make art and design that matters. Our campuses are located in Huchin and Yelamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, on the unceded territories of the Chachenyo and the Ramechush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and throughout the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of the communities and culture. TCA honors Indigenous peoples, past, present and future, here and around the world, and we wish to, res to pay respect to our local elders. Uh, the fall series, which hopefully you saw a few pictures of at the start, is entirely online this semester. It's free and open to the CCA community and everyone around the globe, so just RSVP uh, to receive the Zoom invite. Um, our eight esteemed guests are leading designers, strategists, curators and educators. They'll be addressing how they use design as a tool of empowerment to defy and overcome the most pressing issues of our time. Racial inequality, environmental catastrophe, inhumane technological change. I invite all of you to join us for the remaining conversations in this series where you'll learn about inclusive design, ethical AI, practicing with integrity, sustainable fashion, community enrichment, Afrofuturism, speculative fiction and design for social, economic and cultural change. Our next event, oops, oops sorry. Uh, I want to recognize first uh, and thank Juan Pablo Raal. He is a recent alum of our MFA program in design and he created all of the branding materials for this lecture series this semester. You can read a lot more about Juan Pablo's approach to the commission on our portal page where you signed up for the event tonight and his goal of creating a decolonized expression of design uh, through the woven form represented, representing the interconnectedness of the different events in this series. I'd also like to give a quick shout out and thanks to all the staff in the division, many of whom are working behind the scenes tonight uh, to bring this series to all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next event is on October 22nd. Uh, Fuliyami Wilson is going to be joining us from Chicago uh, in an event presented by the Furniture Program. And she's going to be talking about radical making, Afrofuturism, and speculative fiction. I can't wait to see her. So a little bit of logistics before we move on to tonight's program. Um, we will have about a 10 minutes or so, maybe a little longer at the end for a Q&A from the audience. Uh, at the bottom of your screens, you should see a Q&A button. Uh, we'd like you to put your questions in there at any point uh, during tonight's presentation. And if there's a question in there that you are really interested in having answered, we ask you to upvote that question. And you can see by the little blue arrow on the screen what it will look like to us when we can see your upvote. So uh, please ask your questions all the way through the event and we will get to them at the end. Just a note that the chat is currently disabled just so that we can concentrate on the, pre the presentation. Uh, but we will open it up also at the end of the event so that you can uh, chat directly to Jasper and uh, say thank you or say hello to each other. So could Jasper, Owen and Michael turn on their videos, please? Hello. Hi. Hi, people. Hi. People out there. 
Um, so uh, tonight we're going to be learning from Jasper Wong about how he works with global brands such as Unico, Marvel, Microsoft, as well as his pioneering festival Powwow. I'm really grateful that you're able to come and join us tonight, Jasper, especially as you're also an alum of CCA, and that's really exciting. Um, and here with us tonight is Owen Smith, the chair of the illustration program, and Michael Wirtz, assistant chair of illustration. And they're going to quickly introduce themselves and then provide a little bit more of an overview of uh, who Jasper is and why he's here with us tonight. So thank you all very much. I'm really looking forward to the lecture. Thanks, Helen Maria. So again, I'm Owen Smith, chair of illustration at CCA. And I'm Michael Wirtz, Assistant Chair. Hello. That's great. Um, so this is a really special event tonight. Um, and thank you, Helen Maria, for making this possible. The, the Design Division Lecture Series is a really a special place that you should uh, continue to revisit. Um, one, I'm really happy because we have one of our own, a CCA alum. Um, it's special for me personally because uh, Jasper was in my very first class that I taught at CCA 16 years ago. Um, and so even back then, I knew that he was a, a special artist. Um, he was busy with my class and doing entrepreneurial things already. So I knew you know, he was going, going places. Um, Jasper is an artist, illustrator, muralist, curator, art director, entrepreneur. Um, he's, he's shown his work in California, France, London, Mexico, New York, Hong Kong, Chicago, and Australia. I'm sure there's other places as well. Um, his work has been featured in uh, publications such as Communication Arts, American Illustration, Society of Illustrators, Vice, High Fructose, Juxtapose. So you see that there's this bridge between illustration, fine art world, and, and elsewhere, right? Um, and I think that's one of the special things about uh, Jasper. He's kind of one of the early students that we saw that really took on this idea of like taking control of their career in a way that... Um, we hadn't seen that much before. And, and this is the, the direction that we try to, uh, the thing that we try to instill in students these days. Um, he's the founder of Above Second Gallery in Hong Kong. He's the creator and lead art director of Pow Wow, a nonprofit known for its um, worldwide arts and mural festivals. He's a co-founder of Lana Lane Studios, and he's, um, it's, which is an art center for uh, progressive 2D and 3D works where there's making and teaching space. So as you can see, it's a long, long list and um, we'd love to hear more about it. So everyone welcome, virtually clap for Jasper Wong. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so I've, uh, it's, this, is a, this is special for me because yeah, like I've, I graduated from, from CCA and actually when I first went there, it was still CCAC. So about halfway through my time there, uh, they changed it to CCA. And, and yes, I was, I was one of Owen's first students uh, just many years ago um, when he first taught illustration. And it, it was a great time at that time just because I, I learned a lot. Like I went to high school in, in Hawaii and I didn't even realize that art colleges existed until I took my first semester um, in Portland. I went to a college called Lewis and Clark, where my first art teacher in college told me that I should be pursuing my career, my craft, and my work uh, in an art college. And it was recommended to go to CCA because not only is it a great school, but it's based in a very sort of artistic and very sort of forward thinking city in terms of, you know, it being in San Francisco and Oakland. And so I went there. Um, so my second semester of college, I transferred straight to CCA and it was, uh, it was definitely a life changing and amazing experience where I met a lot of amazing artists, uh, teachers that I am still close to a lot of them today. So, uh, I guess today I, I want to talk about sort of my time after, you know, graduating from CCA and sort of how I try to find my place within the art world and also sort of how I developed, you know, like the festivals and my work as an art director and an illustrator and a designer and different sort of, you know, entrepreneurial uh, pursuits that I've tried to do over the years. Uh, and yes, please leave me questions so I can answer them at the end. This is, this, this is like, I've done a few Zoom talks. And so 
it's always really interesting, or I guess it feels really weird because I'm talking about myself by myself to myself. So the questions and answers are really sort of like, you know, what, what kind of makes it more um, engaging and, and, and more interactive with the audience that's, that's out there, because I can't, I can't see anyone out there. Um, so I'm going to first, I'm going to start sharing my screen so that I can then present uh, sort of some of the slides here. Okay. So I, like I said, I, I graduated from CCA in 2006 and I graduated with a BFA from the illustration department. Um, and I think one of the toughest things for myself as, as a young artist is that I didn't know what to do with my degree. Uh, in illustration during that time, uh, a big part of your career or, or at least what people did in, in illustration with the degree is to do um, editorial illustration or children's books. Uh, and I wasn't really sort of interested in doing, in doing either of those things as much. And so a big part of it was really- All right, Jasper, um, we, we can't see your screen. Can you, um, can you try sharing again? So sorry okay. about that. Yeah, let's see. Perfect, thank you so okay. much. Okay. All right. Thanks, James. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was, was between, you know, doing uh, either uh, editorial or children's books. And I wasn't super keen on, on doing either of those things. And, uh, and so I kept trying to figure out other ways to sort of utilize the skill sets that were, that I learned from, from CCA and, but also try to like develop my own projects and develop my own uh, different jobs of my own and to try to like push my career of my own making. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to learn just pretty much like right out of college was how things were produced. You know, like what was the process between point A and point B? You know, if I wanted to make something or develop anything like whether it be a book or a chair or a shoe or a bag or a hat or anything for that matter, like how'd you do that? Uh, you know, back then, think about this, this being back in like 06, 07, um, you know, we didn't really have those resources that people have today. You know, like we didn't have, you know, the ability to sort of like make one, like one of one books um, or, or have different suppliers that, you know, create, you know, like drop ship shirts or do, you know, direct to garment, like all that stuff didn't exist. Even a lot of self-marketing tools like social media between like Facebook and Instagram, all these things weren't really something that was used as often, especially to promote our own artwork back then. You know, like one of the main sort of marketing tools for us back then was, you know, putting your artwork on postcards and sending it to all the editors and art directors and different people that you knew, uh, that, that you discover and find out about in, in hopes that they would get to you and hire you for a job and, hope, and also hope that you get published in different magazines in hopes that people would hire you. And so I didn't want to wait around in hopes that someone would hire me, in hopes that my career can get jump-started in that way. So I decided to, to move to Hong Kong. And the reason why I moved to Hong Kong is because China is one of the manufacturing capitals of the world. And Hong Kong, in a lot of ways, is a gateway to that. Hong Kong is, a lot of people speak English in Hong Kong because it was British territory for about 100 years. And there's a lot of people there that have ties to China that can help you sort of figure out what to do and how to sort of begin this process of learning of how to develop and, and, uh, and create and, uh, and manufacture things. So I moved to Hong Kong shortly after college um, and it was really a big jump because I've never lived there before. I visited many times because I have family there, but I've never actually lived in Hong Kong. I ended up living there for about four years. And the first thing I did was I just ended up cold calling people uh, I ended up cold calling different people, reaching out to different people that I thought could help me. Um, and I was lucky enough to, you know, get in contact with the manufacturers for Ralph Lauren, Steve Madden, Coach, and other people. And they kind of, and I became friends with them and they kind of taught me, you know, how to go about 
producing things and what it, what it will take, you know, tech packs, you know, materials. I visited different factories. I visited different agencies within Hong Kong to learn. And, uh, and so it was sort of a lot of, after college, I continued my education through my own, um, through just trying to teach myself. Then I ended up working also for different uh, mag uh, like magazines like uh, High Beast. I ended up working for High Beast, which is a street fashion blog at the time. And now it's more like a street fashion sort of lifestyle magazine, both printed and digital. Um, ended up doing work for Adidas and Nike at that time too. And it really helped to sort of then broaden my network of people that I knew that were outside of illustration, outside of CCA, to people that were within the street fashion uh, world and also within the fashion world. But I wasn't really like super interested in doing fashion. I just wanted to learn how to do the process, but it ended up sort of leading me down this path of fashion in a lot of ways. But one thing that I really ended up loving while living in San Francisco was all the artists and all the galleries that were there, you know? And I really fell in love with, with being a part of gallery shows and sharing my work to the public. Because for a lot of us artists, uh, it's a very solitary pursuit. And without, you know, at the time, without really sort of being able to share your work through social media, without sort of like large audiences like you have today, um, really like putting your work into galleries or getting printed was really the only way that people saw your work. And it really sort of legitimized or, uh, you know, we really saw people's, you know, thoughts of your work when you put it out there in the gallery. And I really wanted to continue doing that in Hong Kong. So I ended up visiting like a lot of different galleries in Hong Kong with my portfolio of work at that time, which was really sort of the shows that I did in San Francisco and the work that I did in college. But um, I kept getting rejected at every single gallery that I showed my work to. And the reason why I was rejected, at least what I was told, is because I was the wrong type of Chinese. Um, back in 06, 07, around that period, uh, there was a, being a mainland Chinese art artist and, and, and like say like, you know, for example, if you came from Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen or Guangzhou, et cetera, uh, was a higher, was, was, a, was a big commodity, was a hot commodity. And because I was American Chinese, they felt there wasn't enough potential to sell my work. There's a lot of galleries out there because also rent is very high and the cost of living can be high. Uh, they need to be able to sell work. And they felt that selling an American Chinese artist, they would have it'd be a bigger risk and they didn't want to risk that and, and show my work. So I really didn't have any opportunities to sort of like grow in that field or in that world because no one wanted to take a chance on me. So I had two options. Uh, one option, obviously, just to complain about my situation or two was to start my own gallery. And I chose the latter. Uh, found a, a space outside of the main areas of central Hong Kong, because then basically where I circled here is where most of the galleries are. They're like around the Long Kui Fong central area. And my gallery was not even on this particular map that I found. It was like in Sai Yung Kung. And at that time, the uh, subway didn't even get out there. And that area was known for mainly um, selling dried seafood and selling um, items you will burn at funerals. So, for example, the belief is that if you burn certain objects, then your, uh, then your relative or your friend who's passed will receive them in the afterlife. So they have everything from paper, uh, paper mansions to uh, sports cars to uh, Louis Vuitton bags to uh, you know, even like, like everything, to like slippers and like clothes and like random things. And so I, I, the gallery was in that area. It wasn't the most hippest area. And so there was a restaurant that was there, a space that was, I would say, it was like abandoned or closed for like about a decade. And so the landowners are very keen on, on, turn, on, on anyone using that space, on, on, on them getting any sort of like, you know, rent from that, from that empty space. So turned that, you know, gutted it out and turned it into a gallery by painting the walls white and adding, um, adding doors and windows because at that time it was really just an open space that was a roll up. And this is that, this is that space. 
uh, we called it above Second Street, uh, above Second Gallery, because it was above Second Street, and it was up this this steep, not, not that steep, but this hill where you know if you really wanted to come to the gallery, you really had to sort of really want to come because the buses or the trains would drop you uh, further away. You have to walk or take a one of those like small mini buses, and then you have to like walk up this hill. So that by the time you got to the gallery, you're a, you a sweaty mess and you really had to make the trek to visit us, uh, considering where we were. Um, now, like, you know, they opened up a, a, a subway station there now where it's like really like a block away. But back then there was nothing. You really had to sort of want to be there. Um, and this was, you know, it was, it was one of the few galleries, ended up being one of the only galleries in Hong Kong that really sort of showcased local Hong Kong artists um, that really like, didn't care about how much money we had to make to pay rent because no one wanted to rent there. So, uh, so you know, at the end, like we weren't sort of held down by by the finances of trying to keep the gallery alive because the amount of money we were paying for rent was, you know, like it wasn't like it was it was fairly affordable where it could just be my studio as well because the back half was my was my painting studio, and the front half was the gallery. We held many shows there over the years that that we were in existence in that, in, in that space um, and held many openings. The, neighbor, the neighbors never really liked us because it's, you know, we brought something a lot different than what they were used to. But, you know, uh, a lot of the local creative community in Hong Kong really appreciated us because we really sort of took a chance and try to support the, the, uh, the local artists that were there in Hong Kong. And, and one of the very first exhibitions that we did in that space was the very first powwow. And so the name originally came from uh, comic books. Uh, that was my initial idea, where Pow was a, a punch in the face, like you know when Batman punches Joker. And I saw that as sort of the uh, impact that art had on the viewer, and what was the reaction to that. But Pow together um, is a Native American term, but a gathering to celebrate art, music, culture. So we felt like it was a great fit for what we were trying to do and what we were trying to push for um, with our with our project, with our exhibition. So the very first exhibition that we did, we brought in artists from all over, from France, from uh, Taiwan, from, from the UK, uh, and, and from Hong Kong, and we all worked together. And we had, we had a few missions, you know, to try to like bring something different to Hong Kong. And that one, one was, you know, uh, let's open up the process to the people. Because for, for myself, at least, and for a lot of other artists, we felt like sometimes the process that leads up to the final artwork uh, is sometimes more interesting than the final art. You know, all the all the trials and tribulations and everything that goes through to trying to create create a create a final piece is is sometimes not witnessed and should be shared. Another was to collaborate. Like, let's collaborate together. Let's build together. Let's do. Let's let, let's create work, and 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 work together on paintings to sort of take us out of sort of like the solitary you know pursuits of being an artist and and try to work one on one with other artists. And another was, you know, like, let's not think about having to worry about sell the work, you know, let, let's, let's create the work and, and destroy some of it, you know, so that that way we're not thinking about sort of, hey, we need to sell this, let's do work that we know will sell. Um, let's create something, let's experiment, let, let's have fun and not worry about, about the financial nature of what we're doing in hopes that we, will, we would experiment more. So these are some of those folks back in the day, you know, uh, it's about like, Back in uh, 2010 was when the gallery opened. And we held, we held when, when it was all said and done, we, we, we held different events. Um, we held some events in, in different clubs and, and, in, and in galleries that my friends had uh, that were nearby. Well, actually, they weren't even galleries. They were like sort of like toy shops, you know, like we, we turned uh, you know, open spaces and friend spaces into also like sort of partnering spaces to sort of do the event. In. Um, and, and and it was a success. Um, I'm the I'm the guy in the uh, skin tight pink suit. Uh, and this is the space. And so, you know, at the end, you know, after that after that initial project back in 2010, you know, we thought, you know, it's a great idea, you know, that maybe we can, we can continue doing this this event, but maybe. Maybe I have a travel, you know, maybe it goes to other friends, galleries in other cities, maybe Hong Kong, or not Hong Kong, maybe like Berlin or, or, or Singapore or, or London, 
LA or San Francisco even and, and sort of see where it, where it could go. But friends in Hawaii told me that I should bring it back home to my own hometown of Hawaii. And at that time, I felt that I wasn't so certain about that idea because, because um, I grown up in Hawaii, we never, we, we have a great art scene, but it wasn't like the biggest scene. And there aren't that many galleries. And even now there aren't that many left. And then even like our public school systems, especially since I'm a public school kid myself, uh, you know, a lot of art gets cut out of the schools. You know, it's the first thing that gets cut, art and music from, from a lot of public schools. And, and so I wasn't sure if there would be interest if we did the same project or similar project in Hawaii. Um, but you know, the, but there's no harm in, in trying. So, you know, came back home and did some research, met some people and, and, and talked to, create different partners and reached out to different sponsors because then one of the major issues and, and toughest things is, you know, trying to raise money for it. You know, and, and that's anything with any sort of like entrepreneurial project that you're doing, whether you're starting a brand, uh, whether you're building an app or anything for that matter, you, know, you need to find funding, you need to find funds to sort of make it happen. And doing festivals or events or art shows also can be really hard because if you don't have initial capital, it becomes really tough. So it was a really big learning curve for me because that's something that I've never done or have knowledge doing. And so it was trying to raise, so, so even with the past project, it was trying to like raise money. And, and in this case, it was going to be even harder because we were doing it in Hawaii where maybe funding was a bit more scarce for projects like this. So I reached out to sponsors and some were interested, but at the end, a lot of them ended up dropping out from wanting to support us. And, um, and a, a lot of the reasons was that they didn't feel like an art show or an art festival was a good vehicle to promote their, their brand. So I had three options. Uh, one was to just cancel it, forget it. You know, let's not, let's not even do it. Let, let's not go through the stress and try to make this happen. You know, let's just end it. Uh, two, may scale it back, make it cheaper. Maybe if we, there's like less money to have to raise for, it, it wouldn't, it would be easier. Or three, just go for it. See what happens, you know? And I chose the latter. And when I say, just go for it, what, what it is, what I mean by that is that I ended up using my credit card to pay for everything, uh, to pay for most of it. Uh, outside of like, you know, some friends like Kamei, who's my partner, who helped, uh, you know, he was helping his, his family build a house and they helped us, they let us stay there. Um, and different friends just sort of like offering support in that way. But, you know, in terms of like flights and paint and everything, materials, different things, I just kind of pulled out my credit card and started paying for everything. And I kind of put myself into debt. Um, for that first year, you know, because there was no actual way for me to sort of make the money back through the project. You know, because the event was free, we weren't selling the artwork, um, you know, and so it was really just putting my faith in it and believing in it and being passionate about it and just spending all of this money for it. It took me a while to sort of pay it back, but you know, it was, it was a risk that I was willing to take. And at the time I was young too. So, you know, I didn't really have as many responsibilities as I do now because I didn't have kids back then and wasn't married. I was single and I really sort of believed in it and believed in the power of art. And so I committed myself financially to it. And we made it happen. You know, we, we uh, flew in a bunch of artists um, from Australia, from, from Europe, worked, uh, from, from different parts of the states uh, and we're also worked with local artists and one thing and it was very much a similar project to what we did in Hong Kong um, but in this case the one thing that was really different was that there was a wall in the parking lot of the warehouse that a friend let us use to sort of hold the exhibition and a lot of the artists that were bringing on board were also you know graffiti artists and they said hey we should paint this wall and I never even thought about it to sort of paint the wall you know, for me, like, it was always like, let's do canvases, let's do art shows. But then it really opened my mind to it because, you know, it kind of painting on walls in public places really, like, really sort of supported a lot of the missions that I, that I believed in with the, first, with the first project. One, it's in a public place, so process is shared. Uh, two, um, we can't sell the wall because we don't own the wall. We can't sell the artwork because you know we, there, there's no way for us to sort of 
sort of take the artwork off unless you like remove the wall itself. Um, and, and three, like these walls are a large scale. So, you know, like we could collaborate on it too. You know, and also it gives back to the community. Um, it takes it out of different institutions and, and it gives art back to the people. And then also like it makes these walls come alive, you know, because normally when you walk down the street, you could care less if there's a blank wall. But when there's art on it, like it changes your perspective, you take photos in front of it, you know, and helps to support those communities because it brings people there. So we ended up doing this uh, exhibition um, and ended up doing our first mural that first year in 2011. So we painted on canvases plus, you know, did murals. Um, and so you can see on the far right side in this parking lot, this is the space that we're able to utilize. In the back, there's a warehouse. On the right side, there's that wall. And, it, and the person that owned that wall was, uh, is a veterinarian. And it was really tough to convince her because it was my very first time trying to convince a property to, 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 let, to let artists paint on their wall. And the way I did it really was, because I told her that, you know, it's a win-win situation for her. Like one, you either have amazing art on your wall and two, if you don't like it, we'll paint it over. And so then you'll get a freshly painted wall. So either way, you know, you'll win. Um, and luckily she let us paint on it and then she loved it. Um, the year after that, we, we painted uh, on 12, we did 12 murals. And the, the, the largest Hawaii festival that we did out there was we did, we had 120 artists and we painted about 100 murals in a week. Um, and, and we brought in artists from all over the world and we completely covered the entire neighborhood with art. And from there, we've, we've held that festival in about 17 cities around the world. And then we started doing, you know, exhibitions in, in museums. So this is an exhibition at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Uh, this is an exhibition at the Long Beach Museum of Art. And so after we were trying to sort of bring art to the streets, we also try to tie it back to different institutions and different museums. And in a way to sort of, you know, help to validate the work within those institutions, but also sort of show that, you know, it's all the same. It's all art across the board. Um, and we've done exhibitions um, in a few different museums around the world and, and different galleries. And so, and so now a lot of our festival format works where we're doing public art um, on the streets, whether it be 100 artists or 20 artists. Uh, and we're also doing different gallery shows and museum shows and talks. And, and we're doing uh, different concerts and block parties and different things and workshops. So these are, this is a talk between Fafi and Jeff Staple in Long Beach. Um, different screenings. These are concerts that we've held, different events, block parties. Um, we've had concerts with, uh, you know, with everyone from the Green to Dilated Peoples to Steve Aoki. Um, we've done a, a concert with Eminem um, and Logic in the past. So, you know, we've really, it's, it's really sort of turned into an art and music festival. We've also started a, an art school, a music school, and a photography school as a way to sort of give back to different communities. Cause a lot of, as I said before, a lot of kids in public school systems, um, sometimes artists cut out. And, and so for what one way for us to give back is, is to provide free learning opportunities with, with working professionals within those fields. Um, you know, I started this space alongside Jeff Gress uh, called Lana Lane Studios. And one thing that we felt was lacking, and I know that in San Francisco, there's a lot of these, but in Hawaii, there's none this is probably the only one, is uh, it's a space for artists to come together uh, where they can have affordable studios to sort of paint and work. A lot of artists that I was meeting locally said that they'd be working out of their living room or garages, and it was tough for them to sort of uh, uh, do the work that they want to do because they didn't have a space to do it. And so I convinced the landowner to give us this sort of uh, concrete storage facility um, and allowed artists to sort of create the studios and build and create a community through, through these spaces. Um, it kind of turned into like a, like an artistic sort of, uh, favela in a lot of ways, but there's a music studio, there's a music studio there. Um, there's two tattoo studios, photographers, designers, painters, illustrators, letterpress, um, printmakers, you know, uh, there's about like 30, over 30 artists that now call that place home and create out of there. So and we hold our classes there, et cetera. So, you know, it's been, it's been a long journey for us to sort of like build 
the festival and and it's changed a lot over the years um and it's grown in different ways and one way i'm going to stop sharing these slides now because so you know one way is is that one way that this festival has shifted over the years is that we've become more and more um, focused on on a on trying to use public art to support underserved communities. So we've done different mural projects and different workshops and different different things in um, in a, you know public housing in schools. Um, and we did one project in in Kathmandu, Nepal, where the project was focused in a school there that catered to homeless children. So, so it turns out there's a there's a large percentage of of homeless children in, in that city, and it's hard to get them into schools. So, what they've done there is that they provide two hot meals a day and a way to get them through the doors. And once they get them through the doors, then they teach them. But the thing is, is, is that this school looks very forlorn in a way where it's not very inspiring um, for the kids. It's just blank walls, there's no floors. And so we brought in a bunch of artists to paint every single surface of that, of, of that building. You know, interior, exterior, in the cafeteria, and all the classrooms. And sort of like, and then we also, you know, got shoes donated for them. Uh, we got some cleaning and personal hygiene supplies donated to them, helped to put in some floors in some of the rooms and the, and the restrooms, et cetera. And uh, in, in Worcester, Massachusetts, we did a festival there where, you know, it was in public housing and people really questioned us doing it there because they felt like it wasn't safe, you shouldn't do it there. Um, but at the end, it really worked out great because it added, the people there told us that no one really cares about their community. And so it was great that us as sort of a private nonprofit organization where it's able to sort of give back to them. But also one of the mothers came by and said that she has two daughters. One daughter said that her whole life, people judged her based on where she lived. Um, once she told them where she lived, they, they knew that she lived in public housing and people like looked down at her and it always affected her whole life. And she said that her youngest daughter just days, you know, just days before her talking to us said that she talked to someone and told her where she lived and their immediate response was, oh, that's where all the murals are going up. That's where all the art is. And she said that that, that, that shift in perception will forever change their lives. And, and, and so sometimes, you know, public art and art, the impact it has on these communities can be, can, can be beyond what, what you initially sort of imagine. You know, like it, it really changes the way that the fabric of different communities. One thing that we've seen doing the festival in Hawaii in that area for 10 years is that previously no one really cared to go to that area. It's called Kakako. And now it's full of, of people there, of, of tourists and different people. And what happened is that they, you know, people come by to find the artwork. Uh, they find the murals, they want to take photos, they want to check it out. And while they're there, they discover um, local small businesses and local restaurants and different shops and they, and they go there. And, and, you know, then more people want to move there because then, you know, they want to, they want to open up something in those neighborhoods. And so then those communities are able to grow through just a simple act of putting paint on walls. So it's really helped to sort of shift um, some of these communities in, in, in different ways, just through, just through art. And that's one of the amazing things about being an artist is that, you know, it doesn't have to be a solitary pursuit. It can, you know, be something that can enact different, different change within your own local communities. Um, and so, and, and even like painting beyond the canvas, you know, painting beyond and painting on the side of a building, you know, like my biggest mural I ever painted was about seven stories. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to be able to, to create something of that scale. Um, if you're so, you know, when you're so used to painting something smaller, like on, on paper or on a canvas and to do something that's like a seven stories tall, it's life changing. Um, it, 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 you, your process changes, the way you see things changes, and then also the way that people react to your work changes, you know. Um, and so the biggest thing that we've ever done in, through our festival was 12 stories. And so, and the one thing about doing walls that big is that personally, like I, I'm afraid of heights, so it's been, we, uh, it's, I've had to conquer that fear because I've, I've done murals in uh, Sardinia where like I had to go on a lift and I really 
painted like I painted this two-story building and it was it was tough because that took me a while to sort of get over those fears but you know when I'm done like it, you really feel that sense of accomplishment being able to sort of paint at that scale um so I also want to bring up sort of like where you know during this festival where it led me um in my own professional work because these festivals don't pay me uh it's all volunteer work um it's all a passion project and because you know at the end of the day all of our events are free except for the concerts but the concerts really break even at the end of the day um and i'm, I'm never going to charge tickets for people to, to look at public art uh you know it's it's for the public it's for the communities and and you know that like even all of our exhibitions our talks everything they're all free and so you know but then what has led is that it's it's opened up doors for me in terms of art directing and working with different companies you know um i've i've worked with uh everyone from uniqlo to nike adidas to bloomingdale's neiman marcus um to uh microsoft etc and a lot of it too was also them noticing the work that we were doing on the streets in different cities and hiring me to sort of help curate and artwork different projects and it's and so in that way and and that way it's helped to sort of grow my own personal work as well my own my own personal career as an artist too so you know it's really sort of like for me like what a passion project in terms of like trying to do community work and trying to do uh a public art has also helped to sort of you know create this path for myself where i'm really passionate about public art and i'm really passionate about how powerful it is to communities and how every artist should attempt or try or definitely do work on the streets in a public way or or do murals um in any city that that you're in because all it really takes is finding a wall and some paint and and it can really make some lasting change not only for yourself but but for your community but also like it led me to be an art director in different ways and working with different different uh different brands and different companies um but also, you know, and and also help to sort of like grow your own sort of base of of, of fans and different people to help to sort of like get, get your work out there. Um, and, and also be able to utilize social media later to sort of grow those projects and then spread it globally. You know, now we hold those festivals in 17 cities, you know, everywhere from Taipei to Tokyo, Osaka, um, to Kathmandu. We've done it in um, Israel to Rotterdam, Netherlands, DC, Long Beach. We've worked with South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. So, you know, it might not be, the festival itself may not have, you know, put a lot of money in my pocket, but, you know, I'm definitely rich in sort of friends and family and experiences. And, it, and, it, and it's allowed me to sort of travel the world and meet a lot of different people and, and travel there and be able to paint and work with different artists. So, and it all started, you know, started in, in CCA, being an illustration major and just trying to follow my own path and find my own way um, through my own means and taking risk and and building. So um, I think I'm going to start nearing the end of my talk because I would love to sort of answer any Q and A's that people have, any questions. Uh, can also I'm also kind of tired of looking at myself and talking. I'm trying to like not look directly at the camera every single time, so it's it's a bit odd. But um, yeah, so I, I want to try to end this now, and so we can do some Q and A's. I, I think. I think. That'd be good. I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jasper. The, the thing that I find, before we get to the questions, just to comment, just this idea that you really have done what we've kind of tried to do with, not, not to just to relate to the program, but you, you graduated at a time when it really was about book and sort of normal publishing, editorial and book. And the, the world is a much broader place. And the inspiring thing is that you you somehow knew that and started that process before we ever got to that stuff. So um, it's an exciting thing to see. Um, all right, I think we can start reading a few of these questions. Feel free to keep adding to the Q and A, um, and if you like questions, vote vote them up so that we can ask them. Um, let's see. Um, so the the first question we is. Uh, would, would you say today's society is harder? It's harder to do what you've done? Um, I, guess, I guess the idea is that, has, have things changed over the, over, the, over the years in this kind of like collaborative environment? Um, no, I mean, I, I feel like things have changed for the better because I feel like people are willing to be more collaborative now than before. Um, I, think, I think the world got smaller through social media 
and, and, and different things. And so people are willing to work with each other more and willing to sort of, and, and they're able to share their work and get broader audiences than we did before. Cause back then, like, like when I graduated 06, like, you know, really like self-marketing really centered around postcards, I feel. We even had like classes where we had to like design postcards so that we could send it to different art directors and editors and stuff. Um, and so nowadays, like that's less, you know, people are able to sort of use the way more tools to self-market themselves and connect with not only people, but also other artists and, and, and work on different projects. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, like now, you know, with the pandemic, it makes it harder for us to be out there and meeting people in person. I get that. Um, this year, when the pandemic hit, I lost seven jobs. I lost a lot of work. Um, and, and I'm a freelance artist, you know, and that work is how I pay the bills. That's work is how I, I you know, cover, you know, the insurance, health insurance costs, auto insurance, you know, all the, the crazy amount of expenses that everyone has to incur and pay for like, like every month or daily, you know, to even pay for food. And it became really tough. Uh, so, you know, I, I, but at the same time, it's also a great opportunity to sort of rediscover your work. One thing that's happened to me is that I ended up picking up more commission work this year than past years, you know, like commission paintings for people's homes, you know, like, like private commissions. Um, and then some of the work has started coming back, you know, because I thought that, you know, with the shrinking of marketing budgets in different companies, people, they'll see art as like a secondary cost that they wouldn't want to pay for that they don't need. And I'll lose even more work on future work. But some of it started coming back too at the same time. So, you know, I started trying to like, you know, do other things, uh, work on other things, but also time to focus on yourself and focus on your family. Because previously, like I spent a lot of time flying and going traveling for different festivals or different projects. And I will leave at least like once or twice a month. And I have a seven-year-old and a two-year-old. So it's been great to sort of spend time with family and sort of figure out your work. But I think to answer that question, going back to it, is um, I think the pandemic will end. We'll be allowed at some point to sort of like see each other, be with each other, hopefully hug each other again. And, and we will collaborate together again. And I think, you know, this, this time is just a, moment, just a temporary blip in history. And when we get back together, then, you know, I, you know, I'm looking forward to, to, to collaboration. And a big part of our festival is all about collaboration and meeting together. And so even the fact that, you know, we, we find alternatives, like here we are doing a Zoom webinar so that we can keep talks alive. You know, that's, that's what CCA is doing. It's like, hey, we, we want to still do talks. Like, what are the alternatives? You know, here we, we can do digital talks, you know, or, or we can do digital classes and, and we can still meet each other and talk and develop projects. You know, I'm still developing projects with people. Even though we're not meeting in person, we're still trying to make things work, so. Yeah, it, seem, it seems like um, your, your whole path has just been, you know, you being like super nimble in like really difficult situations. Um, what, so a question, um, what, what was the biggest thing that kept you determined and pushing forward in all these situations where you essentially had to forge your own path? Uh, I think a big part is like, I just believed in it. Like I believed it couldn't fail because for me, my thought was like, hey, you know, if I bring this many creative people together in one place and we all work towards a common goal, like there's no way this is going to fail. It's going to be like something amazing no matter what. Like even because the hard part a lot of times is we're doing work in public places and we're doing public art. And one thing that you don't consider is weather. And Hawaii weather, mm -hmm. tropical weather, like we might get hit by, 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 by rain or by anything that will prevent us from, from like doing that work. And all the arts will be there for like a week or two weeks. And so if we lose that, those days, then we can't do the work anymore. Like the whole thing's a bust. So all the money that we spend and everything to fly them all over, like what are we gonna do? Just like hang out and party all day long? Like what, like what are we gonna do? Um, this happened actually in the first festival that we did in Taipei, Taiwan. The first days that the, we got hit, there was a typhoon that came that was unexpected because they thought that it was gonna miss Taiwan, but it hit directly onto Taiwan. And so we tried to paint through a typhoon, which is essentially a hurricane. Um, which didn't work. And a lot of people's artwork ended up being washed out that they worked on, like it just disappeared. It went back to a, to a blank wall. Like the, like the rain literally like cleaned all the walls off. Wow. But we waited for it to pass. We did other projects together. And then we went back and painted and everyone finished their murals within, within the time allotted, you know? And we were able to do like, like around like almost 15 murals during that period, regardless of the typhoon. So it's also always just being like, being, believing in it, being super passionate and just pushing through, you know, and, and that's always been sort of like my mindset. Great.
yeah. Um, this idea of collecting, connecting to a community, um, you've got a really direct connection, like you go out and seek those connections. Um, somebody's asking about uh, your advice about how to do that. Um, and I'll throw in one other part. Have you ever done projects that were sort of the, like an arts commission for a city or some formalized public art that was asking for artists? Is that something that you've participated in rather than being the sort of like instigator of it? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, yes. Um, so, yeah, so I've worked with different, like, you know, that's the great thing about doing work in different cities that you also become friends with mayors and, and, and city managers and people that sort of like run different art department programs that are within local governments. And I found that I've had more success building personal relationships with these people than sort of submitting my work for, um, for like public art grants and different things. Because when I have a personal relationship with them, and they know the work that I do, and they trust the work that I do, then you know they'll, they'll reach out to me directly to try to like make things happen, um, rather than like trying to like go through this whole RFP process, you know, like a request for public mm. process. Because sometimes you're like up against a lot of people, and you don't know who's sort of making those decisions, and if your work even fits. Like once I, I once applied to ten public art RFP projects, and I got zero. But a lot of the ones that I've been getting now are more based on my personal relationships with working with different local city governments, you know? Um, and, and they go to me for not only sort of like either bringing me on board a project, but also um, curating projects too. Uh, so, but the one thing that you have to learn uh, about dealing with, with, with different cities is that their insurance requirements are way more than most grants in different cities. And so you have to understand how liability insurance works, how workers comp, um, and also even different waivers, like VARA waivers. So, you know, if you're doing public art in America particularly, you have to understand the Visual Artist Rights Act and how a lot of property owners don't want that to come into play because what it means is if you do a mural on their building, they essentially lose that wall. They can't paint over it, they can't touch it, they can't alter it if they need to make repairs. And if they do, you have the right to file a lawsuit. A lot of different artists use it to sort of like file lawsuits against buildings to try to like make money that way. They take advantage of it. And I mean, it, it was really essentially created to protect historical murals in the beginning, but now a lot of more contemporary like artists now have abused it too. So then what happens is business owners, property owners are just afraid to let people paint on their walls at all because they don't want to even have that risk. So we have some, it's called a VARA waiver where basically you waive that right away so that they'll allow you to paint the wall. But then I try to have another agreement where like, hey, at least give it a lifespan of like, you know, a year or more. Um, let us keep that wall around. Like where I like, don't paint it over like a week from now or two days from now or something, you know? And so, you know, th there's things like that to consider. And cities are gonna see like, hey, we need a VARA waiver. And that's totally sort of legitimate. But also sometimes people ask like, hey, I want copyright ownership of the wall. Like I want ownership of the artwork. Because they think that that's the way to protect them. Because if they own the artwork, then they can get rid of it. But the other issue that opens up is, and they can use the artwork to create a ton of other things. Like, like they can make a postcard and sell it, clothes, mugs, whatever. You know, they can alter it, they can change it, they can like do whatever they want with it. And then also has a risk of this sort of really fine, like this really big gray area of, do you own also the style of the artwork or do you own the exact artwork? So if I create something similar, do you also own that too? And will I, you know, be breaking some sort of like, like law by creating work that looks similar? For some artists, like a lot of the work tends to be like, you know, if you're doing like works that are like more pattern based or different things and the work kind of all looks kind of similar in some ways, then, you know, you kind of get yourself in trouble too. So it's also trying to understand these kind of contracts and be able to negotiate out of it. Also when to say no, like we're like, hey, you know, like I don't, I think this is a bad contract. I'm not going to sign it. And they say, well, then you won't get the work. Then you say, you know what, like, I don't you know, like, that's fine. You know, I don't need that job. I'm not going to risk that sort of like just for, you know, just for that project. So, you know, that's, there's a lot of things to consider and I've always been open to artists reaching out to me. I have actually a lot of artists reach out to me, ask me to look through contracts for that reason, to sort of like red flag things that I think might be. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a few, thanks Jasper. Um, it looks like we're, um, and end time is seven o'clock. So it looks, oh my goodness, yeah. So, um, but I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, um, a bunch of questions in here. Um, maybe we could go a little bit, a little bit past seven o'clock mm -hmm. just, to, just yeah. to get to a few more of them. But generally, um, I'm seeing a lot of questions about just getting started. How do you find artists in the community? How do you find spaces in the community? Um, 
somebody, uh, yeah, if you're as illustrators trying to make their own branded business, where do you start? Um, so I guess, yeah, so how do you start finding community and how do you start building your own brand? Okay, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so for myself, it's really just like getting out there, you know, like it's really like, you know, a big part of it too. It's like not being shy about cold emailing or cold calling people. You know, you'd be surprised how many artists or different people that you admire would be willing to sort of answer emails or, or talk to you or pick up a call and, and, and help or even mentor. You know, um, there's a lot of artists that I really looked up to um, and, and now they're friends because I reached out to them, you know, directly. You know, I once even like watched a, watched a documentary on an artist and I was really inspired and I emailed him and he ended up being part of the festival too. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, so, you know, it, it's really sort of being able to get out of that shell about worrying about rejection because the worst thing that could happen is they say no or they don't answer your email or call. But other than that, like, you know, like, like definitely go out there and try to broaden your network, basically. You know, broaden your network by just reaching out to people that you admire, ask them questions, you know, and see what they say and see if they're willing to help you in any way. Um, and, that's how, and that's pretty much like what I did. Like, that's how I ended up meeting different people within those different brands that like, you know, did production for, you know, Coach or for Ralph Lauren, you know, and that's how I ended up working for, you know, street, streetwear blogs and magazines and stuff. It's a lot of it's just like going out and meeting people and whether that be coding or cold calling, you know, and that's, and, and as you build that network, it leads to other people, it leads to other people and you, you realize like how small the industry really is because, you know, it, it's surprising how oftentimes I think that, like how I meet people and they're like, oh, I know so-and-so. Like, oh, it, we're all like really like, like yeah. one or two degrees apart. Yeah, cool. thank you. Um, it seems like a lot of um, the inspiring things that have happened to you are because you took that risk, like you just picked up the phone and did you, were, were you always that confident or is it just like you, you put it on, you fake it till you make it a little bit, you just sort of, hold your nose and jump. <laughs> um, well, no, I think I, I, I don't know if you remember me back in college. I felt like I was super like introverted and shy. Kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like in high school, I, I definitely was. In college, I kind of felt like I was kind of trying to come out of it, but I was still very introverted and shy then too. Um, you know, when I was single, like I, I could never even like talk to a girl in the club. Like I can't even muster the courage, you know? So it, it, it was very difficult for me to do that. It was very hard for me to sort of break out of my shell and be able to do that and take those risks. But it's really practice. You know, it's even like, you know, for example, like public speaking, you know, like uh, it's like the more you do it, the, the, the easier it gets because you get used to it. You know, and, and it's really like, and, and, you know, if you are shy, then email, you know, like you're just typing. Like there's no excuse for that. You know, like it's really like just, just try. You know, it's just taking those first steps and trying. I used to like pick up magazines and then go through the list of different art directors and editors and then like try to figure out all their emails by just typing in their first name and and their um domain name or their first letter and last name and domain name or you know or the full name just to see if one will get get through you know i've tried that many times <laughs> I, th I think those creative folks that you network with they remember the same position that you're in when they're calling right does that make sense so so they 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 were probably the shy creative type and so they remember, you know, and it's flattering when you call them and tell them, but you obviously know about what they do, right? And that makes, seems to make it, so I think that, can you talk about that sort of first calls, you know, like doing your homework, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like, it definitely, I mean, like, if you're reaching out to them, then you probably already are fans of their work and you're, you're curious about their work, you know? And, and I, I receive different emails as well sometimes. Um, and, and it's always yeah, very flattering. And I, I, I think no artist are going to be like, oh, God, why is this guy emailing me? Like, you know, unless, and if they do feel that way, then it's not really worth like working or knowing them anyways. Because mm. there are artists that are like that, that are very sort of difficult um, or very sort of egotistical and they don't want to help people or, or try to support young artists. Uh, but there's also a lot that, but luckily, like the majority is not like that. Like, you'll find that a lot of them are really sort of open and willing to share and willing to support young artists. Um, or even like going to, you know, going to like gallery shows or talks or different things and meeting people that way too in, in person as well. You know, that's one of the great things about even our own festival too. It's like, it's an opportunity to like meet different artists because even more so than like going to a talk at different places because these artists are painting murals. So they're going to be there for at least a week painting a mural. So this is an opportunity to sort of like go out there and meet them in person, you know, and, and, and forge 
friendships and build bridges. Philippe is asking um, about the relationship you might have with an architect. Like, um, do you ever get, I mean, obviously some, some of the work is on a blank wall that's, that's like adjacent to a parking lot or something where it's not an, a big architectural statement. You've done a few pieces that are really integrated into some pretty interesting architecture. Do the people who create those buildings ever object? <laughs> and what's your relationship to those folks? Um, I'm sure some of them probably object. I just never met some of those architects that, because some of those were probably like after the fact. But there are some times where I've been lucky enough to work with them directly um, as, you know, as being a part of the process of them building a building or, or, or space. And a lot of times they have an idea of what the artwork will be. Um, and then we work one on one and provide sort of like, hey, here's, you know, like based on sort of the aesthetics and the work that they're sort of interested in, I feel that will fit into the space. You know, like I find then other artists that sort of like fit that bill and we then work together to try to make something happen. Yeah, so then there's cases where like, yeah, I work directly with, with architects and have done that in the past. Um, and also it's something where I just paint on the wall after the fact. So I have no idea what the architect, I hope the architect loves it afterwards, but I don't, I don't know. Um, so Bruna asked, you said, um, you said that when you were a student at CCA, C, um, uh, majors uh, lean towards heavily towards editorial illustration and children's books. Now that you have a broader idea of what, you know, the, the world is about, what, what the world can offer, um, uh, what are some paths you can see illustration majors pursuing? Yeah, there's tons. I mean, I feel like it's like endless, you know, I feel like there's so much you could do. Uh, you know, because but I also feel like, like as an illustrator, you should also try to broaden your sort of, your sort of practice to also design as well. Because then if you can sort of bridge illustration and design together, and also even like take it beyond and also, you know, do sculptural work, industrial design work too. Like you can sort of like, especially when you're in CCA now, like it's an amazing opportunity to sort of take all of these sort of courses that you, that you normally, you know, that you have access to, you know, and then and to learn from it and see how that can apply to your own work. Because I you know um, everything from like you know you can get into fashion. A lot of artists have started different brands, whether it's like putting your artwork on the clothing, also developing your own fashion lines and different things on shoes and stuff. Also within film, uh, you know whether it be sort of doing concept work, uh, or you know I've done even like I've painted sets before. It pays poorly, but it's fun. <laughs> I painted on a, I painted sets for Jumanji, the the ones with the rock in it. And then I've done stuff for different comedies and for different TV shows. They kind of give you like a lot of creative freedom as long as it's like family friendly. Um, sometimes if they pay poorly, I kind of like write my daughter's name on everything so that I can sort of have that. So when I watch the film, I can see my daughter's name on stuff in the background. Um, and then oftentimes they ask me to like do like tags and graffitis and alleyways and stuff. So that ends up being my daughter being this graffiti artist in all those movies. Um, you know, like, so then there's tons of opportunities out there, like not beyond that, like, you know, doing, you know, obviously like, you know, app, doing designs for apps, for video games, you know, I'm doing some work for, for video games right now, you know, designing different things uh, at stuff that within the environment, um, almost like set painting, but for video games, um, you know, uh, there's so much, you know, you can start, there's so much like entrepreneurial sort of uh, ask uh, different things that you could do. You know, that's I, a good start. Yeah, that's a, yeah, I, you know, yeah, creative director, you know, and yeah. any, anybody in kind of involved with like, a, you know, um, visual communication, right? It's yeah. pretty, it's pretty broad. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a, a really great start though. Um, Somebody uh, said, if you know the Fung brothers. I don't um, know. And also, uh, Hyper Beast, you've had some involvement with Hyper Beast. Yeah, I was uh, I worked for Hyper Beast for for a while, and I um, did a bunch of projects with them. And you can probably find some stuff on there where I've, I, I at one point I was doing a bunch of the artist interviews. So back in the day, like I interviewed you know, everyone from James Sheen to David Cho, the different people. Uh, and I've uh, there's Hyper Beast has done videos um, with us. Uh, for the festival, um, you know, so you can probably Google it and probably find all that stuff on there. Yeah. Um, let's see. Somebody's asking about collaborative environments in the art world. Do you think they become? And I think you talked a lot about this, but um, do, you, do you believe that uh, the collab collaborative environments have become more common um, in professional art world since you started Powwow? Um, not. I would say not in the cities. I mean, like I I started one here in Hawaii. 
but other cities, I don't see them. In, in certain cities, they have a lot of them. In certain cities, there aren't any at all. Yeah. Um, it's really about sort of people within those communities being able to sort of find a space that's where a landowner is willing to sort of allow that to happen. Yeah. Because it's not going to be this like large, like profit generating space. Because even the space that we have now, it's like, you know, we, I, it, it's tough to sort of keep it moving and get the rent paid and everything like that. So, I mean, I feel like there should be more and I feel like people can make it happen, but it, it is difficult to sort of, I mean, like taking on a lease and being a guarantor is, is, is tough. Yeah. I'm the guarantor of mine and it's like, it's always stressing me out too. I'm like, I have to get this rent paid every month and it's yeah. not cheap. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's definitely hard and, and I think it's a big ask. So I think, but there are people that are trying to sort of do those globally because it's, because in, it's kind of like essentially you could do what we work does, but for our artists, you know, but then yeah. you'll need more space than like a desk, you know, you'll need yeah. like, like pretty much like those studio spaces in CCA and in, in SF campus, like those, those cubicles. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's collaborative spaces all over the Bay Area. It's, they're, they're few, I mean, some are, um, you know, sort of more sanctioned than others. Um, but yeah, it, I think it just maybe takes the drive. You, maybe you'd agree just to, just to want to start one up. Um, it also, yeah, and sadly, you you've went to school in an expensive place, and you live in in Hawaii. It's expensive, you know. Places like Detroit or someplace mm. might be the place where those things are happening a little easier because yeah. you can buy a big building, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think it feels like students could disperse and find those places maybe outside. Yeah, people the, buy like yeah. like entire sort of buildings, like in like we do practice in Cleveland. Yep. You can buy a ton in Cleveland for very little. All that Rust Belt place. Yeah. Thing. Although rents are dropping here, I mean, still crazy expensive, but rents are dropping here as well. Um, uh, let's see, should, should, we, should we press on here? Um, I was wondering when you were starting your first gallery, this is Kyla's question, um, your first gallery space and powwow, you stated how you have particular goals of creating public, local, and collaborative spaces. I can imagine as a young creative fresh out of school, there's a whole bunch of ideas and um, uh, a whole bunch of ideas that you might want to jam into this into this initial project. Were there any ideas you had with these projects you had to table? Um, and how did you go about narrowing your goals down? I think a lot of it, yeah, I mean, definitely, like, like, there's always like tons of ideas that you want to put out there. And I think one thing that will always, that always makes it hard to sort of do everything is, is time and finances. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that are just kind of like, some of, sometimes just not financially viable. Like when we first wanted to do concerts, you don't realize how expensive it is, it is to put on a concert. Like it's insane. Like just for like a smaller or medium sized stage, like that's like 70 grand to hundred grand, just that, you know? And, and then plus then you're like paying for like artists, like artist rates, you know, some, some of those guys come in at around six figures just starting. Then, but that doesn't even include like flights, and their accommodations and whatever's on the rider list and everything and also the people that want to bring they want to bring with them etc so unless you're like sort of guaranteeing or being able to sort of sell those tickets to sort of recoup that cost like it's tough like the concept we've done honestly like a lot of them that we've done in the past we break even i think the only person that makes money is probably the musicians did eminem require eminems was were they on his rider no, I wasn't like my buddies at MAP did most of the plan. Now we like just helped most of the like sort of help to organize and like co-promote it. So I didn't have to deal with, well, actually he had different requests where like I couldn't even like meet him. I couldn't like look at him in the face is one of the things. Okay. Yeah, so it's like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you know, I'm just going to be in the background. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, like those kinds, those kinds of things can be, uh, can be tough to do. So like, you know, in the, in, in the case, yeah, it's like, you know, like I can't back then, like, or even now, like sometimes we can't put on a concert because I can't get the funds raised to sort of do one because the cost to do the, the one or one or two night concert costs more than the entire festival. And I might decide not to do it just because of that reason. You know? So like, so financially, like a lot of things end up doing that or, or, or things that sometimes like you want to do a big installation. You know, and, and and something that might hold us back is like liability. Like if we do this installation, will someone get hurt? You know, what are the sort of the legal ramifications that are surround this particular project? And should we do it? You know, and can we do it even? Or sometimes we just get shut down by by the city because they can't, they won't allow us to do certain things. So for those reasons. It, there's a couple of questions that sort of touch on this idea of like your personal work and then all these projects that may or may not make money, but they're supportive of 
artist community. Um, how do you balance with that? And do you ever have to like quit on one just to sort of say, you know what, I really got to get back to, I mean, the COVID is helping you get back to your own art, I guess, but um, how, do you, how do you balance that stuff? Uh, it's hard. I mean, I think we're all learning that, you know, especially yeah. if you have a family, right? Like if you have kids and everything too in the family, like it's hard to balance your work and personal life. And it's even hard to balance your passion projects and the projects that pay you because you have responsibilities. Um, I think for me, it's more just trying to figure out, you know, you know, the time that you have in the day and, and uh, how much time you can like sort of spend on different things, you know? And so I, th I think all of us as as professional artists, we try to always figure out like, you know, sh you know, like, does it make sense if I get paid this much and I work like a week on this thing? You know, is there a way to sort of, you know, lessen the scope on it? You know, and a lot of it also is like negotiations with, with your clients to sort of see like, what do they really want and trying to like communicate so that you're not doing all these like hit and miss sort of sketches and then going back and forth forever and, 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 and doing these like sort of all these like tons of rounds of revisions, which take up all this time. If you sort of like streamline that, then you spend less time on those things and then, you know, you can sort of better manage your, your time too at the same time. But also like, think about your own health as well. You know, like don't like get caught in stress and not sleep and, 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 uh, and not eat. And, you know, and also like, you know, so I try my best to sort of like stay healthy so I can be more efficient as well. But I think also it's like, you know, a lot of it's really like communication with clients and everything like that too, to try to make sure that you're not like, sometimes I, I did a project and literally I went like 11 times back and forth on the rounds of revisions. And nowadays I say on the contracts that there's only two rounds of revisions. And if you want more, then you got to pay for it. Yeah. So that way they consolidate because most of the time they don't want to pay for more. So they're like, okay, we'll try to consolidate all the feedback into two and then we'll figure it out. And usually most clients are like, yeah, we're cool with that. Well, cause they will respect you, right? They'll, yeah. If you draw, draw that line, I think that's really helpful. Um, great. Um, Jasper, you're getting, you're getting shout outs from um, other CCA folks, Stacy Tang's on here and Shannon Taylor's on here. Wanted to say hello. <laughs> Great to hear your talk and and hear about your journey. Um, I forgot about the prank calls to Owen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your notes on my. Kind of like we kind of picked on him because he was a new teacher. Oh my God! And I would just sit there and sweat. <laughs> I think people, don't give anyone any ideas because I think they uh, they will take a, take those up next week. Um, but cool, yeah, sense of humor is important anyway, so that's a good thing. Um, do, do, I have a question about this idea. You, you went to a design and art school and you, you were within the design division in a commercial art field of illustration, but you're often doing things that, that are in the fine art realm. There's, there's sort of, sometimes it feels like there's meant to be a separation, but I think it's, personally, I find it really interesting, the blurring of those lines, and it seems like your career does that. Do you ever get to, caught in that sort of dispute between like, oh, you're too commercial, you're too fine art? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that constantly happens for a lot of people. That's why we're constantly trying to like do work that kind of tries to bridge everyone together in different ways. You know, uh, that's what like, you know, even within our festival, like we'll, we'll work with, you know, illustrators and graphic designers. Uh, and sometimes, oftentimes they're doing their first mural and we're trying to guide them through that. Um, but also then also at the same time doing an exhibition at a, at a museum, at an art museum too, you know, to try to like sort of show that, you know, like that the work that's done on the streets and the work that's, you know, done commercially, it's all, it's all work. It's all, it's all valid. You know, one isn't worth less than the other, you know, based on how it's, based on how it's done. So we're always, I'm always, that's always been a thing. And then I think even like a lot of artists we work with are always like, oh yeah, I'm getting too commercial. I need to be more fine art. But I don't think there, I don't think you have to sort of, you know, have to sort of be one or the other. I think you have to figure out ways to sort of, you know, build your brand or, or, or who you are as an artist and, and be open to everything and, and, and different opportunities and, and trying different things. I, th I think sometimes we worry about that too much and it takes away from our art. I think we stop worrying about that kind of stuff. Right. And if they don't like what you do and they don't want to show in galleries and just start your own gallery. <laughs> well, see, this is good lesson for everyone because it's like you don't wait around for the marketplace you don't you don't tell your art to the marketplace you like make art and then you find you find a way to get to people who will appreciate it right yeah absolutely yeah agreed it's it takes more time maybe right <laughs> but, yeah some more time but you know like you learn a lot of things it, it, like if you appreciate the process and you and you don't see it as like a chore then that whole thing it, it's all a great learning opportunity at the same time 
So um, some questions about like, how did, how did you get in contact initially with Hypebeast and how did you start working with them? Yeah, sure. So, so um, Eugene Khan was one of, or the head editor um, and Kevin Ma was the founder. Uh, I met Eugene at a Kanye West concert in Hong Kong. So, and then, so we met and then we had, you know, we had a lot of things in common and then we became friends. And then that's how I then I started working for, for High Beast. And that, yeah. But I'm like, back then, like there was probably only like, it was like under 10, like maybe like seven or eight people working High Beast. Now it's like hundreds of people. Yeah. But we're talking about like in the, like way back, you know, like there was very few of us working on that thing. That's cool. Aaron Johnson asks, have you done any wide open walls? No, I mean, I know the guys that run it because they're also really tied in with Juxtapose. Uh, and so, but I was actually supposed to do a talk at Wide Open Walls last year, but I got appendicitis like two days before I was supposed to fly out. So I ended up missing it. But I was supposed to do a talk. Yeah, I was watching the Tarantino movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. <laughs> oh God. I need to go to the hospital. I'm like dying, I don't know what's going on. And it turns out to be appendicitis. Ouch. Yeah, well, well, I think I think at the end I was lucky because then the worst is to sort of get it on a plane, you know, like if it bursts on the plane or, or while I'm traveling, you know. So at least I, I got it when I was home, but I was supposed to be there. His movies give me appendicitis too. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a oh? Do you have a favorite CCA class? No pressure if your teachers are here right now. Yeah, it's probably like Old Smith's <laughs> illustration class. <laughs> um, okay. Um, but seriously, how important is community involvement when it comes to your work? This is Willie's question. Moreover, depending on the location, do the strategies change when it comes to fundraising, marketing, community involvement? And how important is catering to the real? How is it? Is it to? Uh, how important is it to cater to the realities of the location? For me, like community involvement is is hugely important. Uh, it's um, like I feel like to be honest, like giving fun. I think a lot of us, I think, I mean, especially these days, like there's no, we, at least for myself, sometimes I feel like my work, at least my personal work, isn't doing anything. You know, that it, it's not supporting communities. It's not, um, it's not doing something to sort of better the world. Uh, I have some of those anxieties about my work, my, my personal work at least. Um, and then it's trying to find ways to sort of like, does my work even like matter in the, these days? especially if it's sort of like centered around humor, because I used to draw like Mr. T a lot, like sometimes like as a baby or like as a small girl. And I just found it, it was just funny to me. And, and, and part of it is like sort of a question on like sort of masculinity and everything. Um, but, uh, but then like, you know, when you find ways to give back through your work, through art, not just like through art, but like just, just yourself, just as a person, you know, they're finding ways to, to sort of give back to your own community through volunteer work or, or giving back to charities, etc. It's important, I, I think, especially when you can do it and just tied to your practice and tied to your art, it's even more meaningful. Um, because it's, um, and also like, maybe you don't like make a lot of money doing it, or maybe none at all, but then you gain other things, you know, you gain a, a more of a sense of purpose, too. Because there, there's been many times where you know, I see the impact of the work that we're doing on different communities and, then, and, and the classes that we're doing with different kids and different students and how it's affecting different people and, and that kind of like, you know, makes it worthwhile to do. So uh, that's all kind of stuff that I feel is very important. And, and if you have the opportunity to then, yeah, find ways to give back, whether it's like through your own, like energy, your own self or through your work, you know, and I think that's always important to do. And also even like teaching, right? Like I think teaching is, is huge. Uh, being a teacher is such a uh, such an such an honorable position to 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 be able to like be a teacher and give back and share your knowledge to like young people um, and now even more so than ever with our kids like being homeschooled and distanced and you're like Damn, how do teachers even do it you know like it's like it, it's it's a tough job you know and and so you know if, if you're able to give back in that way then you know it's 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 hugely important and I think the other part of the question is um how do I shift for if it's the communities. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, so then, you know, one thing that I wanted to bring up earlier too is like, you know, sometimes if you're trying to raise money for funds is, is to understand where the money is coming from. So say, for example, if you're trying to reach out to a sponsor, 
that's a brand or a company, they might want to sort of sponsor for marketing purposes. So be able to sort of tailor your ask and your decks so that it shows that it's a great marketing opportunity. And sometimes you're trying to like do a grant or get money from a city. And sometimes they might be looking at it more for uh, cultural or for tourism or for different things. And you learn to sort of like adjust your ask and your bid based on sort of who you're asking money from. And that's sort of, the, so then it's not always the same ask across the board. It's like how to shift um, your sale of what you're doing, if it's a community project or whatever, to sort of like cater to those people is important to, to understand that. I guess there's always that point when you have to hold the line too, where they, they, you, you find out halfway through that it's really about marketing the, the corporation. Like how do you, have you had experiences where you've had to sort of put your foot down and say, okay, we, I, we appreciate your money, but we actually, it's, we have to put the focus back on the community. Yeah, I think like, I think the best is more to sort of like set expectations. Because yeah. then one thing would be like, you know, we're not going to do a mural that's going to like promote, like we're not going to paint a billboard. You know, so we're, we're just not going to do that. You know, and so if you want to support us, then, you know, these are sort of like what we do and how we're going to do it. And this is how we can give back to you from a marketing level. Maybe it's like, through the through a banners or through marketing materials, uh, you know, through brochures or through social media, etc. And does this sort of and here are the analytics of our reach and our exposure. These are the numbers. Like, is this worthwhile if you put in this much money? You know. So as long as we start going over, hey, this is it. But then if this doesn't work for you, then yeah, you know, we shouldn't work together. But then if it does work out, then yeah, let's try to make it happen. There's one. There's one last question here, and I think it's like a really wonderful one to to finish up the evening. Um, do you feel like, Aaron asked, do you feel like the business side has hurt your creativity? Uh, no, I mean, I don't, to be honest, like you have to fear the business side. Like that's just the way it is, you know? Like if you're gonna build a career, it doesn't even matter if you're just a fine art artist, like you have to figure out how to, how to do the business side of, of your work, no matter what. You know, it's like figuring out like your taxes, figuring out like how you can do write-offs, figuring out, you know, how to handle your contracts, you know, so that you can get screwed over and, 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 you know, how to, you know, set expectations and the different agreements, you know, if you're working in, the, in different cities, you know, like, you know, how, you know, your liability insurance and everything, how that works, workers comp, blah, blah, blah. Like all this stuff is like just stuff that you have to know, you know, and I, I think for myself, like, I don't feel like it hurts my creativity because it's just a different side of my brain. And sometimes I mean, the best way to do it is to, is to separate your days into like, okay, these are the days that I'm going to do business and these are the days I'm going to be creative. So it doesn't sort of interfere. Or maybe it's like, for me, it's like I, the first thing I do is answer all my emails before I do other work. Yeah. You know? And so, and so, um, so it, it's just trying to figure out how to like separate those brains. So they, so you're not thinking about your contracts while you're painting. That's a really interesting tactic. Like getting, getting to be like super friendly with your, with your like calendar and with like your day planner. So it's like, all right, from this hour to this hour, I'm going to answer emails, but then no more. Like I'm gonna put oh, the phone away and I'm just gonna sit down with my sketchbook and draw. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and also I think like another thing is like, you know, hire people. You mm -hmm. know, like like a uh, hire an accountant, you know, hire a lawyer, have a lawyer, you know, have different people that you can go to for questions and they can help you. You know, I'm lucky because my wife is my bookkeeper too. Mm -hmm. And so then she helps me figure all that stuff out for me, which is great because otherwise I'd be spending all this time because I used to do just bookkeeping stuff. Um, but also like, you know, someone that can handle all that kind of stuff. Cause then you shouldn't be wasting a lot of your time doing that kind of work. And if it makes sense to pay these people X amount of dollars to do that and it's worthwhile, then do it. Because sometimes like your time is more valuable. Like the time that you would have spent figuring out your bookkeeping, your tax taxes or dealing with one of these like legal problems, like it, it might take up your whole week yeah. and there's, and you end up paying someone to do it. Then, you know, you, that time can be spent building your practice, painting, doing different work that you want to do. Yeah. I think related to that question is also the idea I mean there's the business running a business and then there's making art but there's also the influence of will this thing I'm making make money influence what you're making and I love to I love that you were saying things like is there a way are there ways we can remove the money from the from the project and then maybe it, you circle back later right but you're not you're not thinking about whether it's sellable from the beginning yeah then, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that, it's the same thing as before, like, you know, set those expectations and learn when to say no. Because sometimes I do work where I'm like, oh, we want this. And I'm like, I don't even do that. Or sometimes they'll send me something like recently for a, for a movie thing. They sent me this image and said, oh, we want you to paint this. But like in your own style or like, you know, like pretty much the yeah. same. Why don't you just hire that artist? Right. To do it? Yeah, that's all that. Like, yeah, why that's need to copy that guy, you know? 
that's always a losing proposition. Yeah, because yeah. because then if the other artist sees it, you know, they're like, what what the hell, you know? What the hell? I don't understand. Like, what, yeah. what's going on here? Like, you should just hire this guy that actually painted that. Right. You know? And so it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense sometimes. And and I get those, and I'm like, you should. I'm, I, you just don't want to say no for those things. Like, don't force it. Because if not, then you think, okay, I need the money. It's the business side. I need to sort of like do this project. And then the whole time you're going to be suffering through that project. Because it's <laughs> and then you can never really show it as your own because it's not your exactly. own. Exactly. It's like yeah. useless. Yeah. yeah you yeah. can like post about it. Kind of, you, just, you just end up just copying someone's work. Uh, well, that's our questions. Um, just, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for, you know, for hanging out. Um, everybody and, and, and hanging in because they have this really, really interesting discussion. It's great to see your work, Jasper. And yeah, just oh, thanks, no, for being, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We'd thanks love to have you come our way when things are normal. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I need to get back out there. It's been a while since I've been to, the, to San Francisco. Yeah. Um, we're, we're doing, we're moving things in a direction about public art. And so it's, I think for some of our students, we've been particularly inspiring in that direction. Um, oh, thank you. So, you know. Yeah, I can even like give less. Like, I, I can. There's different techniques to do public art, and then like, you know, big, a big part is just really just doing it. But yeah, yeah. I can always offer advice on that front. Even you know, that's a cool standpoint. Have you come and do a workshop or something? Would be. Yeah, I could teach you how to like drive a boom lift and a scissor lift. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've got some walls around CCA. Yeah. We do. I was just, I was just scheming. Like during your talk, I was like, okay, what about the wall that's like the opposite the the uh, brewery you know like why not we should we yeah. should paint that wall um exactly all you know, right you put on the safety vest and a hard hat sometimes you're like you just like, like just go yeah like, there, you're like you're not supposed to be doing that there's a long history of like of of billboard pranksters i'm not saying do this but there's a long history of like billboard pranksters in san francisco the, the billboard liberation organization have you heard of them it's like it's like a bunch of a bunch of weirdos from back in the '80s decided that the billboards in San Francisco are really obnoxious, and they would do just that. They'd put a, a vest on and a hard hat and just like go up there and like we they they figure out how to like recreate the fonts and like just yeah they're just super subversive and funny. I look them up. Yeah. The billboard billboard liberation organization. I mean, Banksy does the same thing. Like he just dressed up as a city worker and does his stuff. And then yeah. we've actually done that too on our end too. We've yeah. we've done the same. Yeah. <laughs> We won't say. Yeah. It's great. All right. All right. Thank you. Shut the room down. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah. It's really great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay. We all clap yeah. our children. All right. Well, don't be a stranger. We will we'll talk. Yeah. Definitely. It's good to see. You. Say hey to your family, Dennis. Happy to happy to hear that. So I don't know if you've ever met my kids. My kids are 20, 22 and nineteen now. Oh wow, mine's are seven and two. Yeah, so but they, <laughs> they will be that big, like that, as you as you are experiencing. I'm sure. It's already happening. It's like seven going on to eighteen. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's always a great age too. <laughs> cool. All right, take care, sir. All right, take you care. Care. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. So.